Hey everyone, thanks for joining. It's just about noon, but I'm gonna give it a couple minutes uh, for more people to, to be able to join and then uh, we'll get started soon. I don't mind being visible if you want. Okay. Folks, thanks for joining. Just going to give it another minute or so since we've still got people coming in and then we will get started. Thank you. Hey everyone, it's uh, we still got some folks joining, but it's 12.02, so I'm gonna get us started to make sure that we have enough time. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. Um, my name is Deepa Sivarajan. I am uh, on the Washington policy team at Climate Solutions, uh, focusing on work um, around building electrification policies locally. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be introducing some of my colleagues later as well, um, colleagues and partners who work on this issue together. Really happy to have you all here to talk about the future of all electric buildings and specifically around local action and how you can get involved um, in, in some exciting developments that are happening in um, cities and counties across the state. Um, a couple housekeeping things to start. Um, we are gonna start off with everyone muted and uh, save questions for the second half of the conversation um, after we have a couple short presentations. Um, so if you do have questions before then, feel free to drop them in the chat or um, to wait to, to say them out loud at the second half. Um, we are recording this so that we'll be able to um, show this with participants afterwards. Uh, so uh, just note for that, if uh, when we record this, chats are also recorded. So um, if you have any private chats that you're having, uh, those will show up at the recording just as a, as a warning. Um, and we also have live closed captioning enabled, so you should be able to select that at the bottom of your screen as well um, to be able to follow along if you need. Um, so we're going to start off with a short presentation where I will go through some of the some of the background on why um, all electric buildings are uh, important for for carbon emissions and as well also for public safety and uh, public health. And then we'll talk a little bit about individual um, things that are happening in some of the key cities uh, and counties that we're working in right now. And then I'll hand it off to um, my colleagues, uh, Ingrid and Joelle, to talk a little bit about how people can get involved uh, specifically in, in sort of the campaign side of things. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Okay, so the big question, uh, I think for a lot of folks, since this is a new topic for, for many, including me when I first started working on this, is um, what, what do buildings have to do uh, with climate change and, and why is this um, an urgent issue that we're starting to work on now? So build, emissions from, from buildings are actually the fastest growing source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Washington state. I think we tend to think of transportation as a huge sector that emits a lot of uh, greenhouse gas. Um, greenhouse gases, but uh, as you can see from, from this chart, transportation is a big sector, but the um, residential, commercial, and industrial heating and electricity are the second biggest, um, which includes all of our buildings. And primarily that comes from the use of uh, fossil gas, also called natural gas by the gas industry, um, to heat and power our buildings uh, for space heating, for water heating, for cooking, um, and all those kinds of uses. And those also, uh, because gas also emits toxic air pollution, it is the largest source of air pollution in 
in the United States as well. So from a climate change perspective, which um, you know is, is become increasingly crucial, uh, I think everyone here probably just had to suffer through these, this heat wave that we just had um, in the Pacific Northwest. And it's just really clear that we need to take really urgent action um, to try to slow down climate change as much as possible. And Washington has some pretty uh, strict goals around that to achieve um, greenhouse, severe greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, 95% uh, reduction. One of the key policies that has been, um, that we've been sort of building on is Washington's uh, Clean Energy uh, Transformation Act from 2019, which uh, requires that all electricity in Washington has to be 100% clean by the year 2045. So we can't have coal fired or um, gas fired electricity generation anymore. Um, because of that, it's increasingly important that we shift all possible uh, uses over to electricity and stop using greenhouse gases in the places where electric uh, technologies are advanced and affordable to make that switch. Um, and the state sort of reaffirmed this by uh, showing in the state energy strategy that they uh, released this year that shows that electrifying our transportation and our buildings is going to be the lowest cost pathway to achieving our greenhouse gas reductions. There's really no other good way to get there. Um, and so we really need to prioritize this immediately. So gas use, as I mentioned, also is a big factor uh, in public health. Um, Gas appliances, particularly cooking appliances, uh, emit dangerous pollutants um, for that, that really harm our indoor air quality. And I know that I personally didn't think that much about indoor air quality until recently, um, both during COVID being inside all the time, even before COVID, folks uh, spent 90% of their time indoors. And after, during COVID, that was increasingly true. Um, also think about wildfire smoke, there's all sorts of ways in which we're impacted um, by the air we breathe both inside and outside. Um, and, and gas appliances really contribute to some of those dangers inside. Um, children who grow up in homes that use uh, gas appliance, cooking appliances are 42% more likely to develop asthma symptoms. A lot of that can be mitigated by proper venting and um, of when you're cooking, but most folks don't know how that they should be using um, their vents uh, the entire time and fans the entire time they're cooking. And a lot of households also don't uh, have good infrastructure for proper venting. So this becomes uh, a real risk for folks indoors. Just a short list here. I'm not going to go through it um, heavily, but um, there's a number of different pollutants. And uh, these are some of the ways that they impact cardiovascular, respiratory, um, neurological health. Uh, and, and so we really need to, to be thinking about gas as a public health issue as well. And this also applies to the outdoors, of course. Buildings in Washington actually generate more than um, twice as much uh, nitrogen oxide as power plants do. And so uh, we really need to really need to be thinking about air pollution um, as, as an important reason to cut down our gas use. As I mentioned, this, this became increasingly clear through during COVID when we were all spending a lot of time indoors. It also, uh, there's also evidence to show that exposure to these pollutants actually uh, increases our risk of uh, mortality from COVID. So all of these things are interplaying um, to, to build a story about um, how, how air pollution is, is really uh, impacting us. And that's especially true for our under, historically underserved communities, particularly black, indigenous and people of color communities. Um, segregation and redlining and long histories of exclusionary zoning have, uh, have already situated communities of color in areas that have higher air pollution and have situated you know, a lot of industrial facilities typically in those areas as well. Um, that combined with sort of a lack of access to healthcare and other resources that help protect folks' health uh, means that there's a really severe impact. Um, as the American Lung Association uh, said, the burden of air pollution is not equally shared. It is felt much more strongly by um, our, our underserved communities. Gas is also a safety issue. Um, I think you know we've we've seen a number of different uh, incidents, even in the last year or so. There was a gas leak in the Central District this year, um, in Seattle, uh, in the Greenwood neighborhood in 2016 in Seattle. Um, there was uh, an explosion several years ago that caused lots of property damage and uh, and some some injuries for firefighters. So pipeline explosions and gas leaks are a real risk. Um, and and while we pump gas through you know these highly pressurized pipelines, um, that is always going to be there. Um, one kind of surprising stats is uh, we looked into 911 records in Seattle and found um, that uh, someone calls 911 in Seattle on average every three days to report um, 
a worry about a gas leak or a gas odor. And that means that um, this is the, you know, the actual number of folks who are worried about this is even higher because most folks actually are calling their gas utility. Um, and so those, those numbers are not public, but these are just the, the numbers that called 911. And living in Washington state where we have uh, increased earthquake risk is also a reason why uh, safety is a big issue because like I said, these highly pressurized pipelines run the risk of exploding during earthquakes. Um, and even, even if they don't explode during earthquakes, you know, sort of any natural disaster, um, if, if any kind of uh, rupture happens to the pipeline, it's much harder to restore uh, gas um, lines than it is to restore electricity after any kind of natural disaster. So those are some of the issues with why, uh, why we need to stop our use of gas. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunity uh, when we think about building electrification and moving to completely all electric buildings. Um, one of those is that uh, we're going to see a lot of clean energy jobs be created by this. Um, right now, all of our gas comes from out of, most of our gas comes from out of state, um, mostly from uh, either British Columbia or the Rocky Mountain states. And so, uh, you know, there are certainly jobs that are related to the infrastructure of building gas lines here, but we will, if we shift to electric sources, that there will be a lot more local work. Um, we'll see job increases in equipment manufacturing, renewable energy construction, electricity generation, um, and a study in California showed that uh, there, the net increase of jobs in the state, if they fully electrify, it will be over 100,000 new annual positions by 2045. Um, and that you know, would be scaled down for our population, but would still be a significant net gain in uh, jobs, and those will be clean energy jobs. Um, there are also cost savings associated. So the technologies that we're talking about when we look at shifting our buildings to all electric are electric heat pumps, uh, both for um, heating our, our rooms and heating our water and then induction for cooking. Um, electric heat pumps are highly energy efficient. Instead of generating heat, they actually distribute heat around. And uh, that means that they, they, you know, ultimately you can cut down a lot on your energy use and eventually on your energy bill. Um, and so because of that uh, upfront costs of, um, sorry, the other, another factor is that uh, installing a gas line um, to your home also costs a lot of money. And so when you first are building a house, the upfront costs of electric heating systems are actually $4,500 uh, lower than gas. And then we see uh, overall over a 15 year life cycle because of some of the um, energy savings, it's a $4,300 saving. Um, Washington also has low electricity costs compared to a lot of other states. And those costs are only gonna get lower as more and more people uh, become, you know, become part of the, the system, the electric grid. The other factor here is that if we don't stop our gas use now, um, particularly if we don't uh, provide assistance for, for sort of uh, vulnerable households to stop their gas use now, that means that um, you know, we're building out a gas system that is just definitely going to have to retire at some point, and we are uh, creating new gas infrastructure that is going to be a stranded asset down the road. And the people who are the most likely to sort of have to pick up the bill for that are folks who are left on the, the gas lines at the end, people who don't have the resources themselves to, to get off gas, to get to electric. I'm hearing a little bit of, um, I'm just going to mute folks because I'm hearing a little bit of echo from someone on the line. Okay, so we've talked through a lot of the problems, um, but how do we move forward towards solutions? 100%, uh, sorry. Here we go. Um, so electrification efforts have already started across the country. I think the big, um, big example that we have so far is in California. Starting in 2019, Berkeley passed the first um, ordinance requiring all electric new construction. And since then, 50 cities in California have, um, have passed some form of similar uh, policies. And we have really high hopes for, for cities in Washington to be doing the same. There's already been some movement here. Um, just go through a few examples. Seattle earlier this year passed an energy code update um, that shifts most uses uh, of fossil fuels in new commercial and large multifamily buildings to electric heat pumps. It requires heat pumps for space and water heating in those buildings. Um, large multifamily here is defined as over five stories, so big apartment buildings. Um, Tacoma in April passed a resolution that commits uh, the city to building all of any, their new municipal buildings without gas. And it also uh, starts a process of studying what a, 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 a solar policy for all buildings in Tacoma would look like and, and doing stakeholder outreach to, to see what the impacts of that would be. 
Seattle Public Schools, um, also in February, uh, committed to going free of fossil fuels in all school district operations, including transportation and buildings, um, which includes electrifying all new buildings as well. So we, part of why we wanted to ask you all here to, to talk about this today is that we have ongoing work in a number of areas. Um, and I'm going to talk through some of the individual areas, but uh, certainly this is something we want to see replicated in, um, in states and, and sorry, cities and counties across the state. Um, so I'll go through some of, of the ongoing work. Firstly, right now, uh, King County is considering an energy code update um, that will go to the King County Council in August. Um, that would be pretty similar to uh, what Seattle passed earlier this year. It would require electric heat pumps for space and water heating um, in new commercial and large multifamily buildings in unincorporated King County. Um, so that's a really important one and we're hoping to see other, um, other cities and counties follow suit. Olympia will soon consider a resolution similar to Tacoma's, which would electrify uh, new municipal buildings and uh, start the process of outreach around looking at citywide um, building electrification as well. Um, Bellingham and Shoreline are actively looking at policies to electrify new construction. They're still sort of developing what that would look like, um, but they we expect them to, to be working on that this year as well. Um, and I uh, also want to mention Issaquah. There's been a lot of interest there. Uh, also not exactly sure what kind of policy they're looking at, but um, there has been interest both uh, from the council and from a lot of the community in working there. Um, and Seattle, having passed this commercial energy code update, is looking at, at uh, mechanisms to electrify remaining buildings that are not covered by that. That, so far, the conversations that are happening, could that could include both new um, residential and existing buildings, talking about how we start the, the you know, sort of big challenge of, of making sure we're retrofitting existing buildings, as well as stopping, um, you know, the problem from getting worse by building new buildings uh, that have gas. And so that's just some of the work that's happening and uh, Ingrid and Joel are going to talk a little bit more about how we're advocating in these areas. Um, but also just want to note that, you know, this can this this topic is something that is just new to a lot of folks. So uh, we are hoping to see, you know, any of the, the cities and counties that, that you all are located in consider policies like this um, with your help. The other thing I just wanted to mention before turning it over um, to Ingrid and Joelle is that the opposition has already started. And so we need to, we need to be understanding um, the, the fight that, that we're uh, running against, a lot of which is trying to, the gas industry, uh, putting a lot of money into trying to uh, greenwash gas, trying to sow misinformation about gas because they can see the writing on the wall and know that if they don't, um, don't fight this back, they will be losing their customer base. Um, we've seen across the country that the gas industry is paying Instagram influencers to talk about how much they love their gas stoves. And we've seen locally that um, the gas utilities in Washington have uh, formed a front group called the Partnership for Energy Progress Northwest and have putting a lot of money into um, marketing and advertising that, uh, that talks about how great gas is and doesn't talk about any of the health or safety or carbon risks. So we've got we've to gotta make sure that we understand all the problems and, and are educating other folks as well um, so they don't buy into this situation. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, my colleagues, Ingrid and Joelle. Uh, Ingrid with Stand.Earth and Joelle, who's the field director uh, at Climate Solutions. Ingrid, uh, sorry, Joelle, you are on mute. Thank you. How's that? Yes, we can hear Good. you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, one moment, please. That's not what we want. Just take a second. There we go. Okay. There we go. Can everybody see my slides? Good? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So as Deepa said, I'm Joelle Robinson, uh, Field Director at Climate Solutions. I use she, her pronoun, pronouns. I am here in Bellingham on Coast Salish land, and I am so honored to be here today with all of you and so deeply grateful. I see a lot of names I recognize and heroes in the community and clean energy, climate champions, and also new uh, faces and names that I and I don't know. And that is so um, encouraging and inspiring. Probably like you, 
uh, to, you know, this last few days have been hard. Um, I have a little, little guy, a little toddler. He had a lot of rough uh, meltdowns and hard time sleeping, and therefore I did too, and trying to work full time. Um, but, you know, I'm this age, and I had to check on my elderly neighbors to see how they were doing in this record-shattering heat wave. And it was so worrisome and heavy on my heart. I'm not just worried about all the people uh, and the babies, the elders and the babies and all the people suffering, but also the animals, the pets, the farm animals, the wild animals, and the trees and the plants and all living beings, basically. It was just really hard. And so probably you have been feeling similarly. And um, I have been trying to transmute that um, grief and uh, worry into some action. And uh, that's what Ingrid and I are here to hopefully share a little bit more about today. So as Deepa said, um, we've got a lot going and there's a lot more coming. So if you live in King County, well, first of all, I'll say uh, Ingrid is going to drop into the chat uh, a Google Doc that has links to everything we're talking about. So you have a little mini toolkit. Um, and we'll also be including all of this in the follow-up email. So then you could forward it to folks, too, if you want. And just a recap. But basically, if you live in King County, given that this is imminent, this is happening this summer, we would love for you to take a moment to email your council member. And we have a... Uh, email set up in that Google Doc that makes it really easy. It's pre-made um, that addresses all the points that Deepa talked about. Um, you can customize it as well. I often customize mine starting out, you know, climate is my top priority issue. I'm deeply concerned about the climate crisis. I, I want you to act on this. Um, so that's the first thing. Please send an email to your council members. Second of all, if you live in unincorporated King County, because this is specifically to unincorporated, there is a Google form in there. And if you'd be willing to put in your information, we would be so grateful because then we would follow up with you as we get a little closer to the actual council meetings when they will take this up and we would have public testimony from any of you that are willing, um, you know, because that is like the most germane folks to speak up on that, be on that issue. If you live in Shoreline and Olympia, um, please send an email to your respective council members. Again, we set these up um, sort of addressing the current status of the, uh, the landscape there. So um, hopefully it's really easy. You can again customize if you want and just shoot an email off to your um, council members respectively. Then if you live in Seattle, Tacoma, Issaquah, Spokane, or Bellingham. We've created specific customized petitions for your local jurisdiction, and we can um, get critical mass, and then we will deliver them at key moments, um, depending on where our, you know, where the councils are at any given moment. Um, if you live anywhere else that we didn't articulate, then we would encourage you to take a moment to call or and or email your mayor and your council members. And you could just kind of keep it at the meta. Like, I'm deeply concerned about the use of fossil, fracked, natural, whatever word you choose to use. That's what it is. Fossil, fracked, natural gas in buildings. And I want us to move to clean, safe, all electric buildings. If you get any intelligence um, or you know replies back on any of these emails or these calls uh, it would be super helpful for us to hear what they're saying uh, especially if there's some champions there that we don't know about yet that say I'm with you I want to work on this um, or if there's someone who's saying well I'm kind of with you but I have some concerns that'd be helpful for us to know too because then we can go and help get them some information that will hopefully lead them you know to work, what their constituents are asking for over this summer, we will also have a workshop um, on how to give public testimony. It'll be before the King County one, but it'll be open to everyone. Um, so if you've given testimony before, but you feel like you could use a little brushing up on your skills or you've never given it and it feels like a little bit daunting, uh, our goal is to help you feel confident and uh, well prepared for any of these council meetings, wherever you live. 
um, to give good public testimony and some of our, we'll share some of our best practices. So look for an invitation on that. And then last thing I would say is just, you know, we've got some good things happening already as Deepa articulated. Um, and we still have an opportunity to see which jurisdiction goes first um, to have legally binded or binding ordinances you know, sort of above the resolutions and the municipal buildings or the commercial buildings to say all new buildings. So uh, a gentle challenge to see which city or which city can go first, and that will be a huge catalyst to help other cities follow this lead, not only statewide, but also nationally. So with that, I will turn it over to my amazing co-pilot, Ingrid Archibald from Stand Out Earth and she will talk to you a little about some more things that we can do together. Thank you, Joelle. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to see so many people here. This is so great. Um, thank you, Deepa, also for your amazing explanation and overview of everything. Um, this is such an important issue, um, and it's been really great to get to work with Joelle and Deepa and other people at Climate Solutions on building this movement across Washington. Um, like Joelle said, my name is Ingrid Archibald. I use she and they pronouns, and I'm the Safe Cities Field Organizer at Stand Out Earth. Um, so Safe Cities is a movement of communities who are working to fight fossil fuels um, and to end the expansion of fossil fuels in their community, um, which is obviously so critical in making sure that we achieve climate justice in the timeline that we have to fight climate change and the climate crisis. Um, so I just wanted to take this time to talk about a few other actions that we can take. Um, and one of the most important ways that we can elevate this issue and raise visibility is to write letters to the editor or LTEs. So I'm sure that some of you have done this before. I know a lot of super activists are in the room today and you all know that LTEs are a really powerful way to educate your community, to spread awareness and increase visibility, which like Joelle and Deepa both said is so important in this issue because the fossil fuel industry is pouring money into misinformation and propaganda. And a lot of folks don't know that gas is bad. They don't know that what they're cooking with is a fossil fuel and they don't know that it's hurting their public, their own health and the health of their families. So it's up to us to educate folks and make sure that people understand why it's so important that we electrify buildings um, and transition over to electric appliances. So letters to the editor are a really great way to get that conversation going. And it's also a really great way to directly show support and bring up the issue to decision makers in a public forum, because we know that council members, mayors, their staff, legislators, they're all reading opinion pieces in the local outlets to track what folks are talking about in their communities. So it's a great way to get the ear of the people who are eventually going to be passing these policies. Um, letters to the editor are really simple. They're really easy to write. We have a whole guide for you that's in that document that we shared in the chat, which we'll send again. Um, but just a few tips just to let you know. Um, so the first thing is that you want it to be really short and simple, which again makes it really easy to write because it won't take you very long. They're usually less than 200 words. And the shorter they are, the more powerful they can be, and also the more likely they are to get published. Uh, you also want to connect it to a current event so that you can make it newsworthy. So Joelle talked about the extreme heat that we're all enduring right now, and that's a really great example of how we can connect electrification, heat pumps, the climate crisis, to something that everybody is dealing with right now, something that's in the news, like this record-breaking heat. You also then want to make it personal too. So you want it to be your own opinion. You want it to be an own, your own personal story, why you care about it, because those things are what really resonate with people. That's what really changes hearts and minds is hearing a personal story. And then you want to end with a clear call to action. So for example, if you're calling on your city council to pass an ordinance to require new buildings to be all electric, you want that to be your last sentence so that everybody knows what the solution is to the problem that you've just outlined. Um, and you want that to be a really clear takeaway. Um, again, all of this is outlined in the document. And if you need any help with writing a letter to the editor or in getting yours edited or revised, um, I know that we're happy to help and make sure that you are getting all the support that you need um, to get this conversation out in your community. Okay, next slide, Joelle, please. Just a few other actions that you can take. Uh, so we've talked a lot about taking local action and contacting city council members and mayors, which is so, so important. 
But we also really want to see substantive change at the state level too. And that's going to need support also. So if you can call up or send emails or send postcards to your state legislators, that's a really powerful way to get this issue elevated at the state level too, and make sure that in the next legislative session, we're seeing big changes made. Um, that will help the work that we're doing all across the state and make really big changes um, for our transition to clean electric energy. Um, next is you want to educate your friends and family. So again, we have this huge education gap where a lot of folks don't know what the problem is with fracked or fossil or natural gas. And it's up to us to educate our own communities. And the most important and the most changing conversations that we have are with our own friends and family, the people who trust us and care about us. So I highly recommend talking to folks in your life about electrification, about gas, about the problems, and mostly about the solutions, right? So if you know people who cook with gas stoves, letting them know that they should be using their, you know, their hood vents and opening up their windows and cooking on the back burners, um, or if they're people who care about these things, encouraging them to take these actions too and sharing the petitions with your, with your own community as well and asking folks to take action and be empowered in this movement. Um, the next thing is that you can sign up for the super advocate team. So Climate Solutions has this awesome group of people who you know, are looped in and are taking actions on issues to support climate work across the state. And if you're excited about building electrification and other issues that Climate Solutions works on, you should absolutely sign up to join that team. Um, that link is also in the document that we've shared out. Um, and I highly recommend joining that group so that you're looped in on all of those actions and are you know, able to be involved as much as you can be. Um, the next is to sign up for Safe Cities. So again, that's the campaign that I work on with STAND. Um, and if you want to help end fossil fuel expansion, whether that's getting gas out of buildings or shutting down refineries and making sure that the fossil fuel industry isn't polluting your community any longer, um, I really welcome you into the Safe Cities movement and hope that you will sign up to join us as well. And then finally, if you know builders or healthcare professionals, those are a couple of constituencies um, who have really important voices in this issue, um, because we really want to elevate that, you know, there are builders who support electrification, and there are really critical reasons that we need to do this for public health. So we want to elevate the voices of builders and healthcare professionals. And if you know anybody who are supportive of climate um, and of electrification, or if you yourself are a builder or healthcare professional, uh, please reach out to Joelle, get connected. Um, we really want to make sure that those folks are, you know, giving public comment, signing onto letters, signing the petition, calling council members, whatever folks can do to be part of this. Uh, that's a really key voice. So we invite you to reach out to Joelle to get connected to the campaigns going on in your community. Um, and Joelle's email is in the document as well that we're sharing out with everybody. Um, so those are some actions that you can do. I know that's a lot of different things. I know that some of them are really easy and fast. Some of them are more long-term and require more work, but whatever you can give and whatever you're excited to do to help support this movement, uh, we welcome all of it. And we're so excited that you're all here so that we can work with you um, to build up a really powerful movement for electrification here in Washington, because we feel really strongly that there's going to be a lot of change happening over the next year and a lot of really great work that's going to be done. And that's going to be because of folks in their communities standing up for this. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, I think we're going to go into Q&A now, so I'm going to pass it off. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ingrid, and thank you, Joelle and Deepa. Uh, folks on the phone, I'm Stephanie Noren, um, communications for the state of Washington, and just on to help out moderate some of these questions that we've had in the chat, which is super great. Um, there's been lots of great discussions, and we're trying to post uh, resources there as well. We'll just for folks to know, we'll send out the recording. We'll also be sending out all of these resources in an email uh, afterwards, and we've got a few additional ones as well. So um, if you're feeling like you're missing something, don't worry, you'll definitely get the opportunity to uh, click and review a number of the things that we're posting here. Um, super quick, I think just our most recent questions, and I think we'll go into a little bit about, um, about all electric home building technology and retrofits, because those were some of the earlier questions. Um, just want to have uh, Kelly, our, another policy manager uh, for uh, Climate Solutions on the phone, Kelly Hall, and we have a couple questions around um, some recent state level policy. So I uh, just want to touch on that super quick, Kelly. One is, um, uh, if you 
one was about the Climate Commitment Act and um, the impact on gas uh, companies between now and 2050. Also in that line, um, just around power sources for electricity or sources for electricity for Seattle and then statewide. I mean, you can touch a little bit on uh, what that means for um, with the Clean Energy um, Transformation Act that we passed in 2019 that ensures 100% clean electricity. So, um, yeah, are you with us? Okay, that, great. Uh, and folks, for that question, um, I am Kelly Hall. I'm a, a policy manager at Climate Solutions. And first, on uh, I'll just take those questions uh, in order. On the Climate Commitment Act, um, it, it does require all large emitters to get to 95% reductions or net zero emissions by 2050. And so um, the Climate Commitment Act isn't prescriptive on how gas utilities will achieve those goals, but they do have to reduce their emissions. Um, based on all of the research that we're seeing come out in various states, various utilities, that pathway will largely depend on electrification. Um, but again, we're, we're not, the Climate Commitment Act does not prescribe exactly how utilities uh, will achieve those goals. Um, a second thing that passed this, this past year was an investigation into this question, specifically in Washington, um, and basically the gas utility regulators are going to be opening an investigation that will span about two years, looking at really what is the best pathway for Washington customers, for Washington utilities to decarbonize um, and actually achieve that net zero emissions by, by 2050. So um, more to come on, on what that pathway will look like, but rest assured that they will, they will need to decarbonize and that is, that is now state law. Um, the second question, I think Stephanie was about uh, the power source. Can yeah, just, I just, maybe just touch on um, what uh, 2019's 100% clean electricity law means for gas utilities um, in the state. I think we um, are looking at that as a, as a great support for all of this work and just wanted to clarify that for folks. Yeah, so I mean, our, our electricity is cleaner in Washington than it is in other parts of the US, but we have not achieved 100% clean. There is still some coal, there is still a significant amount of gas. And so 100% clean does require that we have a 100% clean grid uh, by 2045. And what that means is that as we electrify buildings, we're not swapping out one fossil fuel for the building side and just converting over to using fossil fuels for electricity we will actually have um, a clean grid to, to electrify all of our buildings on. Um, we get a lot of questions around, you know, will there be grid capacity? How can we make sure that the grid is reliable? And um, within that Clean Energy Transformation Act, the 100% clean law, there are robust planning mechanisms so that utilities will be looking out for the next 25 years, planning for investments, planning for uh, new solar farms and wind farms uh, to make sure that we can maintain a reliable, safe, clean grid as we continue adding uh, new load from um, new buildings. Yeah, and just for folks, just to reiterate, um, a jog everyone's memory, that does require that we phase out coal and gas from the grid um, over time. So um, there was a couple of questions around coal power in the chat. I just wanted to reiterate, and we, we can send out a link to um, uh, stuff about um, the, we call it CETA, Clean Energy Transformation Act, um, just to remind folks that that is required by law now. Um, and then Kelly, I um, know you might have to jump. So just another quick question on, um, on uh, gas utilities generally. Um, I know we were also gonna talk a little bit about uh, renewable natural gas we're seeing from utilities, um, gas utilities in particular saying, oh, hey, we." What about renewable natural gas? Um, but there are there is a question kind of on what folks can do um, with their gas utility, uh, and specifically if they're connected to outreach folks from PSE. Um, so just maybe a little bit of touch on um, if folks are wanting to talk to their gas utility, what they can do. Yeah, I don't have any specific names, but I think that um, it's just important to note that utilities really, really care about what their customers think. Um, I think especially if you're in Puget Sound Energy's territory uh, and have them for gas and or electricity, um, they're, they're pretty responsive to what their customers think. So I don't have uh, an exact name for each utility, um, but if you can find their customer service uh, person or team, um, again, they, they are pretty responsive. So 
Um, if, if folks want to reach out, I'm, I'm happy to help navigate that, but I, I unfortunately don't have a specific name to give you for any utility. Yeah, I just want to chime in on, on one thing as well, um, in what Kelly was raising around uh, gas utilities needing to decarbonize um, because of the Climate Commitment Act and other reasons. Um, one of the things that we are seeing, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, is this uh, attempted pivot from the gas industry to talk about renewable natural gas as the solution to all of their decarbonization um, requirements. And uh, renewable natural gas uh, is, you know, we think an important part of the transition um, away from all fossil fuels, but there's just simply not enough of it for the gas industry to uh, use it for all the promises that they're making. Um, there was a great article by Sightline that I can post in the chat about how um, the availability of renewable natural gas is not enough to power all of our buildings. And because of that, uh, we need to be saving it actually for some specific uses um, in uh, industrial um, areas where it's really hard to electrify at the moment because we don't have the technology. So if you hear a gas utility saying, oh, we're just going to use RNG, um, renewable natural gas, instead of uh, instead of gas for your furnace at home, that is not the best use of, of the very limited amount of RNG that we have. And we need to push back on that message because it's another, it's another sort of greenwashing tactic to you know, act as if they don't have to make any changes. Awesome, thank you. Yes, good to look out for that. And that's definitely a tactic that we're seeing um, at the national stage with uh, gas utilities. So definitely beyond um, the work in Washington and the Northwest as a whole, there's definitely uh, quite a bit on, on gas utilities um, in New York and uh, North Carolina and all over the place, you know, talking about renewable natural gas. Um, I, let's see, I wanna to get to a few questions that were in the beginning, and I think it covers um, a number of things around fuel switching and retrofits. And so I know Deepa, maybe we could just start out with like how heat pump works and what it, and why, and why it's seen as this uh, climate solution for uh, homes. I think um, for some of us, it's a familiar technology, but it would be great to just touch on that. And then a little bit on what we expect to see in home retrofits. And I know we've said, this doesn't mean that people have to do it right now, but that's um, ultimately, we can talk a little bit about what the retrofit game looks like down the road. Thank you. Yes, perfect. And I'm so glad uh, that you asked about uh, heat pump technology because I forgot to mention a key element about heat pumps, um, which is how they provide cooling benefits and how um, uh, heat pumps are really, really necessary uh, for facing kind of the heat wave um, type events that we're, we're going to see uh, more often. Um, so heat pump technology, as I mentioned earlier, um, instead of your typical either gas or your typical electric furnace, um, is not generating heat. Um, so a gas fired furnace is, is combusting to produce heat and electric um, is using electric resistance to produce heat. Um, an electric heat pump instead actually has a technology similar to um, what's used inside refrigerators, which moves hot air and cold air around to distribute it in a way um, that can be used for, for heating uh, your home or heating your water. Um, there's a, a few different ways you can do that. It can be by shifting from air outside. It can be uh, from drawing uh, energy from geothermal energy from underneath the ground. Um, but this technology is, is not new, but it's getting more and more affordable. And so we're seeing it uh, be more and more available um, for folks, especially for new homes. Um, as I was talking about with the cost implications, um, with a new building, there's really not too much of a burden to uh, install um, a heat pump uh, in your new building because you don't have uh, those retrofit needs. Um, and because of the way that heat pumps work, they can provide cooling in the same mechanism. Um, so a lot of our, our buildings, I think we've all like heard the stats now on how few um, buildings in Washington state include air conditioning. Um, we're you know, lowest in, in the country and in a lot of our cities. Um, and using a heat pump is a really uh, cost-effective way to get both those needs, um, especially when you're replacing, even if you have air conditioning, if you're replacing you know, outdated and inefficient window box units, for example, you're gonna save a lot on your energy costs uh, with, a, with a heat pump which honestly we should, we should find a name to, to show that it includes cooling as well, because I think um, people, people don't know that. Um, so, okay, now, the next question was around retrofits. Um, so, and retrofits, yeah, I, I hear definitely what folks are saying about how expensive they are. Um, it's, it's a big problem and it's one that we're trying to approach in terms of policy by encouraging cities to provide resources um, for folks. 
uh, there's a couple different nuances with that. Um, one is that um, cities, you know, can can try to provide um, loan programs or uh, sort of uh, incentive-based uh, funding to try to make it easier for folks uh, to to pay those upfront costs for switching. Um, those kind of programs um, can can be helpful for sure, and we we do think that cities should do them. We also need to recognize that there are a lot of folks. Uh, who, for whom um, loan programs and incentive programs are still not going to get them past the, the initial upfront cost because it's just so expensive. So especially for our sort of low-income communities and vulnerable communities, part of what we need to be pushing on in terms of policy is for, um, is for our governments to be providing kind of direct assistance because loan programs and, and um, incentive programs sort of only benefit folks who have enough money already, just need that extra little push. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that we could be pushing our cities to do so far, places where I've heard, um, you know, local government people talk about their interest in that is Seattle, we think there's a, you know, a lot of room there, Bellingham is interested, potentially in using some of, um, you know, maybe using some of the, the federal funds that we get uh, in looking at uh, into into retrofit programs. Um, so, you know, any any of the areas that you live in, that's definitely something you could push on your, your governments to do. Another, um, I did see a question in the chat about uh, assistance for switching from a gas boiler to electric. One thing to note there um, is that currently um, our public utilities in Washington, for example, Seattle City Light, Tacoma Power, um, those public utilities, which uh, offer electric service, um, uh, some of them as well as gas service, but, but all offer electric service, are currently don't have clear authority from the state to offer incentives for people to switch from gas to electric. They can offer you incentives for a like-to-like -like replacement, for example, for you know, upgrading your gas furnace or upgrading your electric, um, but not to switch. Uh, so one of the things that we actually need to be uh, helping out on the state level um, is to, to pass policy at the state level to allow public utilities to offer those incentives. Um, private utilities are not impacted by that um, legally. They can offer incentives. In fact, uh, Puget Sound Energy, which is both a gas and electricity provider, um, did in the past offer uh, incentives to customers who wanted to switch to heat pumps. But as this issue has gotten more political, they stopped offering that incentive. Um, so even though they have the ability, they don't want to lose their gas base, even though they're also electricity providers and have not been helpful um, in trying to trying to help people make those switches. So definitely the, the state policy uh, factor is something we're working strongly on and will be needing um, you know, support for in the next legislative session as well. Stephanie, did I answer all the ones that you just named? I think so. And I am just going to post, um, you know, I, I just one of the things we want to do with this work too, and this this new kind of for some folks, I think it feels really new. I think for us, sometimes it still also feels fairly new. This focus on buildings and and talking about um, the way that we heat our homes and heat our you know space and water heating. Um, I'm just going to post a link to for the chat in the chat for folks um, about uh, someone. Deepa and I have been talking about um, this um, man named, I think, Donald Baird. He's with a company called Block Power that's actually working to do um, energy efficiency retrofits for low-income communities. And they are working specifically to um, install heat pumps uh, for, for low-income folks. And it's just a really cool story. And so, you know, there's different ways in which building electrification is happening across the country. And this, he's working from a from a private sector angle, from as a climate technology startup, really not a, necessarily from the policy angle, but definitely he's got some really cool stuff to follow. I think Deepa heard him on a podcast recently, and I've just been, he was fe recently featured in the Washington Post. So just a nice way for, for us to feel like this work is is definitely happening across the nation, and it's not something we've just sort of picked out of the blue um, in Washington State. It's definitely something that um, we're seeing happen all over the place. Um, I want to give Joelle and uh, Ingrid a chance to just um, reiterate some of the resources that we've got. We've had a number of questions about different cities and kind of where folks are at. Um, so uh, Joelle and Ingrid, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, uh, one is um, just reiterating what where petitions are and um, how folks can find out about uh, new petitions if there are some. We've had a question about um, how to be on the super advocate team. Uh, so maybe just a general uh, re-upping of, um, of getting connected to field work. Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and thanks everyone for those thoughtful questions. Uh, so uh, we will drop in, uh, go, go ahead and do that if you wouldn't mind, Ingrid, um, the Google Doc. 
And in there, it says, you know, if you live in King County, send an email here. If you live in Olympia, send an email here. If you live in Shoreline, send this email. Um, so they're all very clear, I hope and think, uh, as well as if you live in unincorporated, which is really important. Um, the second part of your question, Stephanie, what was it? <laughs> oh, just a reiterating for folks. Oh yeah, just reiterating for folks kind of getting connected to um, oh, yeah, super advocates. Super advocates and and feel, you know, just kind of upcoming now that we've got legislative session over and um, was less email traffic from us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so and Ingrid is putting in some of the uh, actual individualized links there. Um, in the Google Doc, uh, there is a sign up for the super advocates, or she's just putting it in there now. Um, and also, uh, like she said, safe cities. So we're going to then, when there's a moment like, okay, you know, um, something's happening in Olympia and we would really like a lot of people to call or email counsel. Now's the time and we would give you the update. Um, that would be, you know, the way we would communicate with you if you're on those lists. Um, and if you RSVP today, which you obviously did, then we have all, we, you know, we can communicate out to you. Um, from whatever group you got this information, if it was from 350 or Stand or Sierra Club, um, you know, there's folks we're working together as an organizing team to uh, coordinate as much as possible so that we can, you know, reach out and, and let po folks know as things get more galvanized, uh, more ways that you can help. Uh, Ingrid, anything else that you want to chime in? No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I guess just to really quickly just add that, you know, we'll be continuing to build up petitions and, you know, emails to council as things are happening. Um, and if you're working on this in your community and you want us to build, you know, a petition or an email to city council, um, that's something that I know that my team is certainly happy to do. I'm sure Climate Solutions as well. So if you have an idea for an action that you think would be meaningful, reach out to me and Joelle. Um, and we'll work with you to make sure that the grassroots tactics that you want to use in your community, that we can support you in doing that. And I'll drop my email in the chat again, too. It's also in the in the Google Doc at the end, and it will come in the follow up email. And I would just say, you know, uh, Ingrid, thank you again for going through the LTE, the letter to the editor uh, information with folks. Now is obviously a perfect time to get lots of letters in. I think it also makes a difference to the editors if they're seeing a lot of people are connecting the dots and they're saying these are climate impacts that we're going through right now and these are solutions of how that we can help address the, the climate crisis. Um, so, you know, now is a very good time to get those in. And as, the, as Ingrid said, even if it doesn't get published, you can send it to your mayor and your council members so that they can see um, that you care deeply about this. Back to you, Stephanie. Uh, just really quick, um, I'm gonna post this. We've had a number of questions around hydrofluorocarbons and um, dangerous refrigerants um, in the chat. And so I um, just wanna call folks' attention to um, a rule in 2020, um, I think it passed in the 2020 uh, legislative cycle to phase out the use of hydrofluorocarbons um, in Washington state. So I'm um, just posting that here from the Department of Ecology. And if you have, um, as always, if you have other questions around um, the 100% clean or clean energy Tran transformation act, we're happy to answer those and um, point you to some resources to um, continue to look at how our utilities are generating um, electricity to be 100% clean. And that's something that, um, is definitely on we're on the path and it's required by law which is really great um just really quick on the energy code piece um want to touch on call attention to folks answer from deepa in the chat and um if we need to clarify we can do a little bit here is that um i think the code piece is, is a little bit wonky for some folks and some buildings are covered by codes and some are not and so um there was a question around uh, low-rise residential and um you know five stories or less and just want to reiterate that different cities um regulate different buildings differently so it is a fairly complex uh piece and it's a number one, it's one of the reasons why um, the commercial codes have been a little bit easier to access from a city ordinance standpoint. Um, and so just Deepa, you want to touch a little bit about on state residential energy code and kind of 
just clarify that for folks again? Yes, absolutely. So if you didn't, first of all, if you didn't see the question in the chat, um, thanks straight for a couple of great questions. Um, the first one was why, yeah, why did Seattle um, only uh, include commercial and large multifamily buildings in their code update? And that essentially is because um, cities in Washington uh, are preempted um, by the state in updating their residential energy codes past what the state is already uh, approved of. For commercial buildings, which includes large multifamily, they are able to go further than the state um, but it, meaning they can pass policies that are more energy efficient, um, but they, they're building off of the state code. Um, so the state code, um, the weirdness of the way the state code cycle works is that what Seattle passed was actually their 2018 um, energy code update. So there will be more uh, energy codes coming from the state. Um, so Drake's second question was because state uh, cities are preempted, can we push the state uh, energy, the state uh, building code council to update their residential energy code to be better? The answer is yes. Um, I believe that process is going to be happening next year and we can, uh, we can share more information about how we can advocate for that. Um, but that reminds me also that I wanted to bring up that currently the state building code council is reviewing the commercial energy code. So back to commercial and large multifamily. Um, and there are proposals um, in their meetings right now to require heat pumps uh, for space and water heating, just like Seattle did. And that would then apply to the whole state. Um, so uh, I know that they're looking for folks to help give testimony on that too. Again, it's, a, it's kind of a wonky issue, but one area is if any of you or um, folks you know are local business owners who support electrification, um, then hearing from folks in those meetings would be super, super helpful. Um, and I can, if you just connect with me personally, I can uh, connect you with the right person to, to figure out how to how to testify and, and kind of what person to talk to there. So I'll put my um, name in the chat. So that's that's for the state building code for commercial. Uh, again, you know, working on residential energy code stuff is also going to be helpful, but um, that's not happening at this moment. Great, thank you. I still. Personally, I'm like, which ones are which and how is this still a thing? So um, glad to do that. All right. Uh, we've got four questions or four, four, we have four minutes left. We don't have four questions left. Um, so just want to uh, take the time to thank folks for coming and thank our speakers. Thank Ingrid and Deepa and Joelle and Kelly for being on. Um, we've had some awesome participation. We had over 100 folks here today just really speaking to um, uh, the interest and um, need for action across the state. So big thanks for, for folks tuning in. I know uh, webinar fatigue is real and staying in your hot house during this week, if you don't have a heat pump and don't have air conditioning um, is a real challenge. So uh, thank you everyone. And we will be sending out an email with all these resources, all these links. Um, and Joelle, sounds like you wanted to say something. Yeah, one last thing. Uh, if everyone would, that you're com everyone that's comfortable would be willing to come off of uh, uh, you know, put on your video so that we can see your awesome faces. We would love to get a couple of pictures. Uh, it's just inspiring and uh, helps us kind of get to know each other a little more. Uh, we would take a couple of screenshots. Smile. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Uh, so. Great last activity for the team, Joelle. Way to go. Uh, all right, folks, look for an email from us. We'll have all these links and all this stuff, for all the things we've talked about for you. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much all for coming. Be safe. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.